we go? Good? Yes. Okay. Um, the message today is going to be about biblical hope. Uh, and today, um, especially want to send uh, a message of hope to Greta and to Denver. Um, I, I'll never, they have a special place in my heart. Because many years ago, on the first time that I ever came to Northern Ireland to speak in churches, and, and Pastor Denver and Greta gave me an opportunity to speak. And the Lord has blessed our ministry abundantly through the opportunities that came as a result of that moment. And then other churches opened their doors and allowed me to go speak. So they have a very special place in my heart. And I hope today that this, um, this message will bring a hope to them too. You know, for whatever reason it may be, through this time of pandemic, it might have been because of the pandemic, it might have been because of other reasons, but I feel it's the time that the enemy has tried to steal away our hope for the future. But I've seen a God who is a God who's way stronger than anything the enemy can do. And I've seen God restore people's hopes for the future. And that's what I want to share with you today. That hope in God is way different to hope as the world knows it. Let's take a look at Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 24 to 25. Romans 8, 24 to 25. And as you're looking up that verse, I'm just going to give you a little bit of the background of what's been going on with all of our children in Colombia. And our children's homes and our school were closed for about 14 months during the pandemic because the government decided that all schools had to close. And because our house's license depends on the school license, then that means that the homes too had to close. And even though we tried to find exceptions, it wasn't possible. And our children had to go back to their very, very poor homes and very difficult living conditions through the time of the pandemic. And we just prayed and prayed and asked God, how can we bring a hope and be a hope and maintain that hope for our children and their families and so many other needy people through the pandemic in Colombia. You know, this, this verse in Romans, it's got two really interesting instructions to us. And it says, if we read from verse 24, it says, For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? And there's a clear instruction that comes in verse 25. It says, but if we hope for what we do not see. And there's an instruction there to us that when we hope in God, we should be hoping for what we do not see. Because our God is the God of making impossibles possible. And we've seen that so many times in the time of our ministry. And there's another instruction that comes in that verse and it says we should eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So there's a message in that verse, not just talking about eternity, but talking about all of the different journeys that we take in our life. There sometimes might be journeys for a day or a few weeks or months or years or a lifetime. But there's a clear instruction there. And the clear instruction is to hope for what we do not see and to wait for it with perseverance. I think this pandemic time has been a time of perseverance. And we've been hoping for life to go back to normal, for life to go back to perhaps how it was before the pandemic. And if you've had things stolen away from you, hope stolen away from you by the enemy during this time of pandemic, the message that I want to bring to you today is persevere in your hope that God will restore those things that the enemy tried to steal away. You know, hope is very important in the Bible. If we look at 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and it's a very well-known chapter, 
What does that verse say? It says, and now abideth these three, faith, hope, and love. It's right up there. With faith and with love is hope. But when we say we hope in God, we're saying something very different to how the world sees hope. And I'll explain that to you in the teaching today. We prayed when our children had to leave and had to go back to their very poor homes. We prayed, Lord, how can we be a channel of your hope to continue giving hope to those children, to their families and to needy communities? And one of the very obvious things we could do was food. Throughout the time of the pandemic, praise God, we were able to give out over 10,000 bags of food to very needy people who didn't have food to eat. Not just our children and their families, but also many people from needy communities. And we started to see God make a provision, a miraculous provision, that we could be the channel of that hope. You know, we had a chicken company that called us and they said, we have chickens. Do you want to receive chickens? And we said, yes. They said, we, we heard that you're helping people and we want to help you. And this truck pulled up at our house and they gave us thousands of chickens. I've never bagged so many chickens in all of my life, I can tell you. But we had the privilege of giving those chickens out and we tried to give them out as quickly as we could so they were as fresh as possible. And I would walk down the road around our house and there were several days that we just needed to get these chickens given out to needy people and we'd give out tickets and say, if you want a chicken, come to our house this afternoon, we'll help you. And for weeks after that, every time I walked out of the house and walked down the road, people would say, hey, it's the chicken guy. Is there any chickens today? But with every chicken we gave out, we sent God's word with it in Bible tracts. And God was sending his message of hope, not just through the provision of food, but through his word. And you know, when we went to buy all of the food for our families and children to make these food bags up, you can remember at the start of the pandemic, there was all this panic buying. And we went to the store where we buy sometimes quite a bit of our food, and we had 25 trolleys. And we're walking around, and we're putting the food in the trolleys, you know. Well, people got so mad with us, because we weren't meant to be panic buying. But what people didn't realize was that for us, that was normal. We normally go to the store with 25 trolleys. We weren't panic buying. Had we been panic buying, we would have had 40 trolleys, you know. It, it was just, and then my wife Janine, she said, well, we dare not tell them that we're buying all this food to give it away because everyone will follow us home. But God made a provision and allowed us to be a channel of hope for our children and for our families. And I hope today that this message brings hope to you for God to restore the things that the enemy tried to steal away. So I want to talk about unbreakable hope. When I started to look up the biblical meaning of hope, it's way different to the world's meaning. The world's meaning might be, you might say, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. Or you might say, I hope it does rain tomorrow. That's kind of a wishy-washy hope. God's hope isn't like that. When I looked up the Hebrew words for hope, it means an unbreakable cord. I thought that was amazing to understand that. That when David said all those times, my hope is in God, it wasn't a wishy-washy hope. He was sure that God was going to bring him through that moment. Our children, when they left the home, it was like the enemy stole away all of their hope. The bed to sleep in, good nutrition, a safe place to be, being able to receive God's word every day. It was almost like the enemy, all of those things and many more, tried to steal them away. But God said, no, I will restore those things. These are my children. 
and the enemy is not going to have success. You know, the word in Hebrew, when I understood it, the Holy Spirit just moved on my heart and took me to think of a tightrope walker. You know, his life depends on the unbreakable cord. Every step that he takes along it. The direction in how he conducts his life. If we think about how we conduct our life in accordance to God's word, the direction for the tightrope walker, the rope gives the direction. So if we think about our relationship with God being walking along a solid, tight, unbreakable cord, God gives the direction. And God directed us what to do every moment, every step of the way through the pandemic to be able to be a channel of hope for our children and their families and many people. And you know what's the goal? The goal is wherever the end of the rope is. The goal is wherever God puts it to be. And when we talk about hope, we apply it in the biblical sense of hoping for whatever God's will is for me and for you through this time. And not losing sight of that goal that God puts. I'm not talking about hoping for worldly things. I'm talking about hoping for whatever God determines. And you know when that tightrope walker gets on that rope, before he's even stepped on it, his mind is focused that this is going to have a good ending. And when we start to take different journeys in our life and we're hoping in God, we need to be focused that this journey, however short, long, or whatever it is, is, will have a God-centered ending. And all through the pandemic, every time we ask the question, when will the children be back? We want our hope restored. Not just the children's. For Janine and I, our hope was to get the children back to have them back in the schools, to have them back in the homes, to have the corridors full of happiness and joy again and children running around. And boy, when they came back, was there an outpouring of gratefulness and thankfulness to God in our children. And that was an incredible result of the pandemic in a a very strange way that when God restored their hope, the outpouring of gratefulness to God was something incredible to experience. And so we've thought a little bit about this unbreakable hope. So I'm going to take you back to that verse in Romans and say, if you're going through a moment right now and you feel like your hope has been stolen away, God is saying, persevere, and persevere and persevere in that hope, believing in that unbreakable cord that it's going to have a God-centered ending. I'm going to tell you um, about (laughs) a whole miracle that, that happened at our home. So as we're giving out these bags of food, we have uh, all of these huge boxes uh, of which we've been given the food out of. And they were all empty. By the time the end of 2020 came, we'd given out 6,000 bags during 2020. And then another 4,000 in 2021. And at the end of 2020, we had, in one of these boxes, we just had one of them full, well, not even full, with some bags. And we started to count them, and there were 46 bags. And we said, Lord, we know that here in December, more people are going to come, and we're just praying and asking you to help us to be able to help them. And a pastor friend of ours called and said, I have 30 families that need help. Can you help them? And we said, sure, okay, yeah, come along. So he came to the house, and we started to give him food bags, but we hadn't really been counting. And then we realized that it seemed like we'd given him more than 46 And we started to count, and we'd given him 60 bags of food. And we're going, okay, has anyone been putting bags of food in the box? No, nobody. Nobody had been putting bags of food in the box. And we began to see that God was doing a miracle of multiplication at our house. 
And you know, we read about those uh, miracles in the Bible. And I'm standing here today saying to you, we see those miracles. We see God do those things. I can only give testimony to that and glorify his name. And then we had uh, another friend came. And then, of course, we didn't want to count how many bags were still in the box because there were still bags in the box. So another friend came. We ended up giving 10 bags to them for some needy families. And then we had a Bible group, or we have a Bible group in our local area, and they needed help. We gave them another 10 bags, and there were still bags in the box. 80 bags of food had now come from that box. And I'm going to stand here today and say, I believe in a God of miracles. And then we looked in the box, and there's still bags in the box. And by the time 2021 started, we said, okay, we're going to count them. We just want to know. So we start counting them. And at the start of 2021, there were still 52 bags of food in the box, more than there had been in there originally. I mean, praise God for that, right? And then we gave them all out over that, that couple of weeks at the start of 2021, and that was it. The box was empty. And then God made a provision, and we went again and did all of our big grocery shopping. So I know a God who gives unbreakable hope. I want to look at uh, the whole story of the prodigal son today from Luke 15. And so if you want to uh, look in your Bibles to Luke 15... As I was thinking about hope, you know, the hope for Janine and I has been the children coming back. And immediately the Lord brought to my mind the whole story of the prodigal son. And I, I'm not looking at it so much at the point of view of the son, but at the point of view of the father. Who I can only imagine must have hoped in God and hoped in God and hoped in God that his son would return. So let's look at the story, Luke 15, verses 15 to 16. That's where I'm going to start reading, but I'll just give you the background from verses 11 to 14. Basically, the younger son had taken his share of the father's estate and had left and gone away and he'd lost it all in wild living or prodigal living. So how bad did things get for him? Well, let's take a look in Luke 15, 15 to 16, it says, Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Can you imagine? You know, and I thought about Certainly our experience in Colombia of people not having food to eat in the pandemic and how bad did it get for them. And I thank God that for our families and, and for many others we were able to be that channel of God's unbreakable hope for them. And I just wondered how many people they reflected on their relationship with God in that time of adversity. And maybe people who normally wouldn't have given much attention to faith or to God perhaps cried out to God and said, Lord, help us in this time. Now, you know, in this story, I can only think of the father crying out to God and saying, God, help my son turn away from his wrong ways and come back to your path and come back to me and to have his hope restored for the future, because the son too lost all of his hope. Imagine him going from where he was to the situation that he then found himself in because of his decisions, and his hope was gone. But God uses those moments to sometimes do powerful things in our heart. And you know, the son, his life was turned around and that time of difficulty brought him back to his walk. Well, if we think of us as sinners, 
when we go through difficult times and we turn our life around and we repent of what isn't good and we bring our life back to our walk with the Lord, my goodness, that's a time that the Lord restores our hope for the future. And I can only imagine that when that son came home, when he came to that realization and when he changed his way of thinking and he repented of the things that he'd done wrong and he came back to be in line with his father's thinking. Or perhaps if we think of it as Christians, to be in line with our heavenly father's thinking, then God restored hope. It says in verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. You know, I can only think about our parents. Our parents told us there was miracles and multiplication in their houses. They said, we scooped the rice out of the bucket and it never ran out. They said, in fact, we had so much rice in our houses that we gave out to our neighbors. Praise God for that. Our parents saw God doing miracles in their houses. They didn't perish with hunger. God's unbreakable hope brought them through. And in verse 18 here, the son says, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. But you know that decision was so important as it is for us when we have things in our life that don't glorify God. And we turn them around and we come back to God's path. And God restores our hope. Lucas 15, verses 22 to 24, I can only imagine the joy of the father when the son came home and he saw how God had responded to his hope. He said, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. And when our children came back to the homes, I'll tell you, there was an incredible time of celebration. Why? Because God restored their hope. And what the enemy had tried to steal away, God said, no. I will restore their hope. And through the most difficult times, I am fully willing and able to restore their hope. And God brought them back. And to hear our houses filled again with the laughter of children running up and down the corridors. And that first night, boy, I'll tell you, they were just so excited, you know. And, and now, we, obviously, we do have rules and regulations and things in our house, you know. But that day we said, just let them jump and be joyful and give thanks to God because there was an outpouring of thankfulness to God and our older children who had the most understanding of everything that had gone on took us to one side and told us we are so grateful to God and to the foundation for all the help through the pandemic and for God restoring our hope for the future. So God's unbreakable hope and now we can see God's hope restored through times of adversity. And I want to finish with this. I'm going to show you a little bit of my DVD, but I want to finish the, the message part really with this. That we also have a hope for eternity. And that is the most important thing to us as believers in Christ. I want to share with you from Romans 5, verses 1 to 5. Romans 5, verses 1 to 5. These verses say, therefore, having been justified by faith through our belief in Jesus Christ and what happened on the cross, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And when we stand in God's grace, that is a place of goodness and provision and protection and blessing and all of those things. And it says at the end of verse 2, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And today I want to say our children rejoiced in hope because they had seen the glory of God in many occasions through the pandemic. And so had we at the foundation. And it says in verse 5, if we skip to verse 5, it says, Now hope does not disappoint, because God's hope is a sure hope, not a wishy-washy hope like it is in the world. And when we say we hope in God, we need to understand what that means. It said the root of the word hope means to wait. And so what we're saying is, thinking about that unbreakable cord, that Lord, I am waiting in your strength. I'm waiting for your direction. If we think about the direction the cord goes in, I'm waiting for the goals that you set. Not my goals, your will, your goals. And I am focused on a God-centered ending to every journey I begin in faith. And that's what I've seen in our children. And that time of adversity and difficulty has brought them to a deeper realization of their faith. And if they can hope for bags of food and see God respond, boy, I'll tell you, they can hope for eternity, for sure. So today I'm going to show you a little bit of my DVD and then I'd like to finish in prayer. called Children's Vision International. So we have 170 children and families that we're helping right now. This is Bogota. This is the south side of the city. It's one of the poorest areas of the city and where a lot of our children come from, these areas. So many of our children would come from homes like the one you're going to see. There are homes that have mud floors, very difficult conditions. Can I just get the music down just a tad, please? Thank you. And you'll see a lot of situations like this because many of our families recycle things to be able to survive. Some have running water, some don't. And so when the children come to our home, it's like God gives them a new hope for the future. This is the Genesis house, the Exodus house is our older children our older boys. Leviticus house is our middle-aged girls and the numbers house are our older girls. And so we also have our school which is the beginning of wisdom school and at our school we teach right from uh, nursery right up to the end of high school. And when the children couldn't be uh, there in school we printed thousands of uh, pieces of paper of homework guides because there is no internet, no Wi-Fi and none of those things in, for our children in their homes. We couldn't do anything online and we gave out thousands and thousands of, of pieces of work for our children to be doing at home. This is our 11th grade class and they will be graduating in December. We also work very hard on hunger relief we serve about 600 meals a day at our foundation. There's a, some of our uh, 10,000 bags of food that we gave out during the pandemic. And we bagged all of those bags. Boy, it was a lot of work, I'll tell you. These are our children when they returned to the school in February. Boy, they were so excited. And even if it was just for the snacks, boy, they were even excited about that. 
And they all had their little white mustaches. These are our kitchens, and our kitchens have sprung back into full action. We process all of our own food, all of our own vegetables, peel and chop and prepare and freeze. Now, in our dining rooms, as I said, we serve about 600 meals a day, but also through the pandemic, praise God, we've been able to finish our new building that we were building. God even provided for that. And we're going to be up in our output of food to 900 meals a day in our new kitchen. Our children were so excited also for coming back to be able to share God's word and to be able to do devotions and to be able to pray together. So this was what it was like at our house when the children came back. And boy, we knew they were home. So this is the Genesis house, and this was the first night when the children came home. (laughs) I think you can see there was an outpouring of joy. And uh, our washing machines and dryers all swung back into action. In fact, I think the washing machines about had a heart attack because of how much work they had to start doing again. Uh, some of our school uniforms waiting to be washed. And of course, we had to give out all of the toothbrushes again and all of those things. And our children, when it was bedtime, we couldn't get them to go to bed because they were playing with all the toys again. Now, each of our children have their own bed. Some of them in their homes, they have a bed, but that bed might be shared with many other people. And as we were going around this night taking video, (laughs) we came among these two, their brothers. Oh, surprise, I'm in here too. (laughs) But for our children, even to have a bed again, God was restoring their hope for the future. Our older children, they were all excited about being uh, with their games again and being able to play table football and uh, real football too. You know, for our older children, we've had the privilege this year of seeing some of them who have left our foundation now graduate from the university. And Miguel, one of our boys, um, just next month, will be graduating from the university as an architect. So now we have an architect in the family and we have a couple of social workers now and you know we're starting to gather all this group of professional people and I told Miguel, um, when we do our next building project, I'm just letting you know, you're the architect (laughs) and you're working for free, I told him. (laughs) So this is the Leviticus house, the middle-aged girls from 11, uh, six to 11, sorry. And they were really excited about, um, firstly, homework, which is amazing, but also about being able to do their arts and their crafts and also their devotional time and being able to learn God's word together once again. Now, this is a beautiful house and we call it the Princess House. This is the Numbers House and these are our older girls. Now, as you can see, we had to do all of the markings the same as you've got here. (laughs) But it was just amazing to have them back. And when they came home, God restored their hope through a time of adversity. This is doing devotions. These are our younger children in the Genesis house. And this is one of our workers leading devotional, and that's Bridget. And Bridget grew up in our home and graduated from our school and now works for us. She's a wonderful blessing. So this is our new building. So this was the groundbreaking ceremony in 2018. And that was Janine and I as we were starting with foundations and everything. And back then, before the pandemic, the children even came to check we were doing everything right, you know. (laughs) Thank you for all of your prayers and support and encouragement for this project especially. And boy, we poured concrete. I can't tell you how much. Seemed like it was endless. That was the building about a year ago. And this is it today. And our blessings building is finished. Praise God. We just finished it. 
It's absolutely beautiful. And it's a place that God is pouring out blessings to help many people. So the first floor has the uh, humanitarian aid storerooms and we send humanitarian aid out all over the country with the help of the armed forces. And this was our new kitchen. This was how it looked a couple of months ago. And just before I left to come on this trip, we had all of the new kitchen uh, equipment installed. It's absolutely beautiful, state-of-the-art, wonderful kitchen that God has given us. And that kitchen will be producing 900 meals a day. So, boy, it had to be good, I'll tell you. But when our kitchen staff came to look around the kitchen, there were tears. They said, this is beautiful. We even have cold rooms now, and Janine had to go in and try them out. <laughs> this is our new dining room. And the God, is, God is preparing us to help more people. Because in this dining room, we can fit 250 people to, to be able to give them food. This was when we were giving out some of the clothes to our children when they came back to the foundation. And they were so excited to have clothes again, I'll tell you. This is God restoring hope. Our new uh, third floor has a new administration area and a new area for our technical team, social work, psychology, our nurse and our nutritionist. And you know, for many years, I've told you here about the medical missions we do all over Colombia. We have helped many thousands of people with medical missions. Well, now we have our own, very own medical unit in our new building. So this is the new medical unit, and we can't wait to finish the whole process to get it approved and to have it operating. We have uh, four consultation rooms. One of those is for minor surgeries. That's the dental room. And that's a big thing for us because we do 700 dental appointments in the year. Can you imagine? <laughs> and every time we have to go two hours across the city for those dental appointments, and we, we don't go one at a time. We take a group of 10 or 12. And then we have this beautiful bakery kitchen. My wife bakes birthday cakes for each and every one of the children on their birthdays, and she loves to do bakery things. We're going to be teaching bakery classes to the children and bringing great joy through that. And I offered to be the official taster, no problem. <laughs> yeah, this is truly a place of joy in our house, I'll tell you. And then the final area, the fifth floor area, has a whole sports area. We're going to be putting down AstroTurf and some netting. We still have that to finish off. Um, but God is providing a safe place for our children to be able to play. Our children can't go to the park at the night time because of the people that are around the park and because it's dangerous. So it's great to be able to have that place. And here are all of our children saying thank you and God bless. <laughs> I'm just going to finish off with this. There are some comments of our children. We asked them how they felt about coming back after the pandemic. That was the girls waiting to get their clothes. And this was the boys when they just received theirs. But our children told us some of the most incredible things. Sharon... She got this beautiful pink dress in her clothes. Nicole told us it's a new opportunity for her life. This is Helen. She says it's a special place and many children wish they could live here. Jamie, she said, because where I live, it's dangerous. And Paola, Paola has a very difficult home situation. Jurek. She said, because there's lots of girls to spend time with. Shira, she was all happy to have a bed to sleep in. And each one had their own reasons that they were happy. God restored their hope. Valentina, she was all about the food. She said, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and all the snacks, she says.
This is Karen. Karen would have been often locked up in her house. And so for her just to have that freedom was incredible. And this is Lorena. She said it all in one comment. She said, I'm finally back in the place that I always wanted to be. Deanna Marcella has been with us since a baby. We saved her life. And she's 17. She said, I was with an aunt, but it didn't feel like family. And she said, and this feels like family. This is where I'm loved and cared for and provided for. And she's going to be graduating from high school in December. Yes, praise God. Oh, and Natalia, she's six. She said, because of mommy, Janine, and daddy, Richard. <laughs> oh, she blessed my heart with that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop the DVD there. So, I hope today that if you've been going through a really difficult time through this pandemic, and it might be for the pandemic, or it might be for other reasons, we must never lose sight of the fact that the hope that our God provides is an unbreakable hope. And it's a hope that is restored in times of adversity. When we look back to God, God restores our hope. And the most incredible thing that we have is that hope for eternity. You know, I want to finish off today by just... Uh, reading a verse from 1 Peter. And this is a challenge that I want to give to all of you, and it's about hope. 1 Peter 3, verse 15 says this, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready, always be ready to give a defense for the hope that lives within you. Always be ready to give a witness, to give a testimony, to be able to tell people what is the special hope that lives within us. That special hope that is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And the verse tells us how to do it. It said, do it with weak, meek, meekness and with fear. We're told to do it nicely. So, I want to leave you with that challenge today. And, you know, I hope, I pray that Denver and Greta have heard this message this morning. And I pray this message will, and to their family too, will bring a message of hope. That God, hope, his hope is unbreakable. And his hope can be restored through times of adversity. And he gives us our hope for eternity. So I'd like to finish in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord. Father, for your hope. It's very different to worldly hope. Because the meaning of your hope is an unbreakable cord. Father, that cord, when we trust in it, provides us with our strength and with everything that we need. And Father, that cord, in the direction that it goes, provides us with the way that we should walk our life with our direction and always in accordance to your word. And Father, wherever the end of the rope is, Lord, that's the goal that you're setting for whatever particular journey that we're on. And Lord, when we step out in faith in the small journeys of every day and in the medium journeys and in the long journeys and in the lifetime journeys, Father, as we step out in faith, we're focused on a God-centered 
ending. Lord, so I pray, Lord, Father, for people here to experience too what I've experienced, Lord. Father, that when the pandemic or other circumstances tried to steal our hope away, you, our almighty God, our great provider, our saviour, said, oh no, I will restore hope. When we go through that time of adversity, Lord, you said you keep focused on me and you hope with perseverance, as the verse in Romans said. And Lord, your promise is to restore our hope. So, Father, I ask for all of those who have had that hope stolen away or the enemy has tried to steal that hope away, Father, I pray that you will restore that hope. And, Father, that you will allow us the privilege of being able to testify to others, Lord, the reason for the hope that lives within us. So, Father, I thank you for this church, the work they do in this community, Lord, and let them be a shining witness to this community for the hope that you give through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I thank you for that, and I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.